Ehas Club presents Stories to Create Podcast, where the tale of our guest takes you back, way back to where the story first got created. Now, to help create this new story, here is your host, Cornell Bunting. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of Stories to Create Podcast, right here at Eos Club. We've been telling stories and we've having our guests go back, you know, go back to the early years. And uh, it's when I tell you guys, it's been a joy with all the different guests that's been on the show. But I got to tell you guys, man, I'm excited because today guest is the founder of Seven Twin Cuts Barbershop. Uh, he also has uh, Andis Clippers Global Educator, which is a beautiful thing. Um so right now, what I would like for you guys to do is join me in welcoming Mr. Sean Casey. What's up, man? Thank you for having me. <laughs> man, it. listen, listen, yeah. listen. This is beautiful. So I want you guys to know today in the space in EOS Club, we have our VP of EOS, Mr. Ryan Eisenhower. Did, did how's, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Happy to finally be here. It's been a long time coming. Yes, it's been a long time coming, people. Busy man. So, you know, this is good, man. Uh, dude, it's been it's been a minute. It's been a mm-hmm. minute, man. The last time we hang out with kids, how, how much years was that? It's going to be, two. Th- I want to say right before pandemic. So, to the end of 2018. Yeah. Early 2019. Yeah. Maybe yeah. 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. That, that, that was beautiful. So, you know, before we dive into current, we want to take our listeners back. Okay. You know, to Sean. And as, as we talk, you know, definitely going to have Ryan be jumping in here and there as well um but i want to go back man to uh the growing up years okay the younger years okay. the what would you call that uh ryan elementary your, 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 but, yeah your formative years yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> all right all right back in new york back in manhattan yeah so back in new york i was uh raised by my grandparents i lost my mother at nine months Whoa. Um, yeah so my grandparents took me in you know we're talking late seventies. Yeah. She was a she was in the, she was a model. Okay. And my dad was in the hair industry as well. Okay. Uh, Studio fifty four. What? You know, <laughs> drugs were heavy back in that time. Partying drugs. Unfortunately, my mother had like a wild night. Ended in uh, you know, she passed away from from overdosing one oh, day. Okay. okay. Yeah. So. You know, if anything, it's like I, I never hold on to it because my grandparents were were amazing people and they took right. me in with a lot of love. And my father was amazing too. Like he worked a lot, so it's just uh, it was just I would have more a little bit more of a home structure. Okay. Same with my grandparents and my father. So my relationship with my father those early years were like, you know, every weekend, and then, at, at, you know, when there was a kind of my grandparents moved to Florida, you yeah. know, and th- that type of thing, I would see my dad a little bit, you know, maybe a few times out of the year and stuff. But we right. got a great relationship now. But them early years was, uh, you know, it was it, it was it was good. Yeah, I had loving parents, but I was wild. Yeah, I was a really wild kid. Okay, I just uh, you know, always look to get into. So, can I ask you, <clears throat> when something like that happens to you and you're coming up, you had just mentioned to me that growing up in New York, right. you may have gotten a little bit of trouble, right? You and your friends yeah, might have been running yeah, around sticking sure. your nose where it shouldn't have been. For sure. Did losing your mother like that at an early age, how did that impact? Did that impact your perspective on getting involved with drugs or getting in trouble or anything like that? So the good for, for, for whatever reason in my life. I never dealt with hard drugs. I never did a hard drug. So I was actually born, uh, when I was born, I was like addicted to to heroin at birth. Wow. Because wow. my mother was just kind of, you know, during that time, she was, uh, even when she was, they, you know, my grandmother was telling me like when she was in labor, they wouldn't give her any type, they wouldn't give her any type of anesthesia and stuff because they would have lost me as a kid. Wow. So I was born with baby blue syndrome. So I wasn't really even supposed to make it. So oh, I came out, everything was healthy, nine months, you know, unfortunately, amazing person though, because all the stories I heard from everybody about her, you know, she was definitely like a hippie of the 70s. Yeah. You know? I mm-hmm. feel like yeah. my soul is... 70s childs yeah. like in my like I, my i got a record player at home all the stuff i listen to is like all 70 vibes just my whole okay. my whole feeling i must have really got that from her just the whole even the rebellious way of thinking and stuff and 
just would be interesting to, you know, have her and have those conversations. I always said if there was one person in my life that I could ever meet, yeah, would be her. Because wow. I think you're just having that relationship raising with my grandparents is that age separation, right? Yeah, so yeah. they they know things from a different era. Right. Where she would have been like twenty four years older than me. Right. So if for like my first relationship or would have been any challenge, would have been a little closer. bit of out of touch. <laughs> right. Yeah, I felt like it was always a little right? bit yeah. out of touch. Like I would have that like that sports talk with my <clears> grandfather, my grandmother, she's you know, she moved here in the fifties from Tripoli. You know, from so, Tripoli. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she moved over here. So she's wow. just you know first generation from from coming from such a wild country. Like she grew up with the Gaddafi's. Like she got stories yeah. where like they were both children together and seen him come into power, and then she moved with the family and moved to New York, and then she met my grandfather over here, and just interesting, dope stories. Do you, do you think the way your mother mm -hmm. passed away did that affect the way your grandparents? raised you or had a hand on you completely i always wondered why they were probably so strong on what i was doing and where i was going who yeah. i'm hanging with and you know i felt like this this overbearing strict um which you probably hated at the time which was because then i was naturally like so an, i'm such an independent person and such it which caused a lot of rebellion so anytime i've had some kind of strict laws on me right. acts, I, able makes me act more rebellious so i think right around that middle school years is where it was just like, I, want, I need to get out. I need yeah. to do things. I need to just, you know, have fun. Right. And uh, little by little, I think it's just your surrounding as well. Like, uh, I think I wasn't too motivated in school. I was, um, there's two type of learners. There's a creative and there's an adaptive. Right. And I believe the system is built for adaptive learners. So, right. Mm -hmm. And especially being a kid from the 80s and into the 90s. You say system education or just like the matrix? like The matrix the whole in system. general. So <laughs> I think like the school system is, you know, now I think it's different. We see them in a digital world. So we right. can see there's a lot of success without the traditional ways. But also being raised by my grandparents is like do great in school, get the scholarship, go to college, get the job. Yeah. And it's like, that wasn't for me. I literally was daydreaming. I was held back in first grade for what? daydreaming. And, yeah. you know, I just wasn't a good student. I was bored. It was anything I apply myself in, I'm interested in. Yeah. I'm great at. But what I'm not, what doesn't inspire me, I have no interest in. Okay. So there's a big gap between understanding adaptive learning and creative learners, which even stems back to the family because you can hear through your door when your door is closed the parents at home and if it's not just me i think it's many parents don't say oh you know what's wrong with him or why he doesn't get it or the teacher you know the teacher saying oh he's just not getting it and he needs to try this and the parents at home why why is it why are you failing at these grades because everything is built for school right but at the same time there's that creatives which you know we we spoke about a little bit before the podcast where Working with your hands, there's so many trade schools that right. you can get into yeah. and be so successful at, but we right. don't, they don't teach that in school, right? right? right. Just learn your Which ABC is still education. It's just, yeah. it's just a education outside of the, right. the system or the yeah. matrix, right? Right. So it wasn't that you weren't going to get educated. You just had to have something that interested you. And yeah. you got a little bit of a kick in the butt in yes. high school too, right? Some, right. Something, something or someone came along. For that, sure. That for sure. There. So I think the time I got into high school, I was like, so in like middle school, like I got in a little trouble with, with, with the law, hanging out with, with some friends and, okay. you know, I did a little juvenile, you know, issues and, you know, I remember like, man, disappointing my grand, grandmother, my grandparents so much. I was like, this is not the move. But yeah. still, like, I was like, all right, you know, I'm still trying to do things without getting caught. Right. Um, and I was just getting in the direction where I just did it the minimum to pass high school mm -hmm. and I'm getting into my senior year and dating, a, dating a girl. And I'm like, you know, she got pregnant and Whoa. that was like, that was reality. It was the scariest. It was the scariest moment of my life. I'm like, yeah. wow, I don't even know what I'm doing in my life. Where am I going? There's not a college. I don't, <laughs> yeah. not, obviously I don't think I'm going to college right. to, um, man, I'm like working at a movie theater on the weekends and I'm delivering bagels during the daytime after school and right. working at like Hertz running car, vacuuming cars oh, man. at nighttime. I'm like, I'm a kid. I'm a kid myself. I'm immature myself. I'm so, not thinking then, but it was scary. So you had like three, four jobs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What kind of Jamaican, bro? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they don't make bagels down there like they do up No, there, right? so with my grandparents. So this is so my story is I I lived in New York till I was 13 years old. My yep. grandparents moved to Florida 
uh, 93. Okay. 92, 93. Okay. I moved with them. I went to a couple of years of middle school here. Yeah. I went to high school here. Yeah. Okay. And then I moved back to New York. And that's when I had my, that's when I moved with my father. That was the first time I had oh. that relationship with my father. Right. So that's when I was going to high school here during my senior year, you get off early. They owned a, a deli. Okay. Yeah. So my grandfather, you know, he's Greek, had Delis in New York, you know, being oh, familiar, yeah. you yeah. know, Greeks and, and delis go hand in hand, right? So he, his, his dad had a had a, a a restaurant on 125th Street for you know back in those early days, and then he had a deli out in Long Island for the long time, and then he brought that here, yeah. so it was very successful. So I'd come off to work and I'd just drive around and do deliver sandwiches and stuff. So it was like so, sort of like a New York deli, right. and uh, when my son was born, you know. Yeah, I was probably in the worst place. I, I was either destined to, like, get myself killed or get arrested. Yeah. And my father called me up. And it was one of our realest conversations. He said, what are you doing with your life? You yeah. got, like, a four-month-year-old kid. Yeah. What is your plan? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. What do you want to do? I'm like, be a barber? Yeah. And the only reason why I said being a barber was... Yeah. You know, I was one of those young guys with a beard already. Like, I was in, like, 10th grade. I was already growing a beard. beard. So I had a little trimmer because the barbershop I'd go to, I could save money without them doing my beard. Right. And you're right. just in high school, so I only have a lot of money. So I get a haircut. They would trim it up. And for me to maintain it, yeah. I would follow it. Right. The second thing I did realize that I had a passion watching them cut hair. Yeah. Mm. So I was sitting in the barbershop and it was like you'd wait for a couple of hours. We'd go on the weekend, school's off. Everybody would show up on the Saturday and you'd watch, sit down in the shop for about a couple of hours. Everyone makes jokes. And, and it was just a fun time. But I, I was inspired or I took a lot of interest onto the art of them cutting hair. So I'd watch them and then I'd start doing it myself. Yeah. So when also my dad was in the hair industry, he does he does hair color. So he didn't cut hair. But he did. A, he made great money for himself. I was yeah. watching how he lives. I'm like, okay, wow, you're doing pretty good for yourself. Maybe there's some good money in here. Yeah. So it was just one of those things. I was like, uh, I'll be, I'll be a barber. Yeah. So he said to me, he goes, well, you know, you have to go to school for that. Yeah. And I said, yeah. And he says, I'll help you out. I'll, I'll get you into school. I'll yeah. pay for your, for your barber college. And and in New York, it's a lot different here, and it was a lot cheaper. You know, yeah. now like prices to go to school is. It's, up there. it's good money, but still better, more affordable than, you know, you going to college if that's not the option, you know, right. for like now I think anywhere is between 11,000 to 18,000 and you do 10 months of school and you got a, 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 license. a license for, you know, you got a skill for the rest of your life. When I went to school, it was probably like about like $1,500 for 500 hours in wow. New York, right? Yeah. So he helped me out. I moved with him for the first time in New York. And little did I know, I just really started loving it. Like, yeah. I just was in school and it's just a lot of passion behind it and started to become really good. And, you know, I built up my name in New York and I lived out there till, you know, eight, nine years. And then I moved back here to Florida because I was visiting back and forth when my son was born. Right. And I was visit him. And then out the blue, I think the noise and, the, and everything else just started frustrating me in New York. There was something in the air that was like, why is everything you're trying not quite working out? Right. And I felt there was a separation. I said, maybe I need to get a little bit closer to my son and just kind of worked out. I came here. Yeah. And the difference between being such a fast city and being in such a uh, rural town. Right. Um, I was like, well, how can I make this work? See, if I stayed in New York, I'd probably freelance. And, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, the way I like to work, I would probably be cutting the New York Knicks, the right. way I market and build relationships. But right. here, you're not going to do that. Right. And I said, well, okay, well, let me get in the shop, work for a few years, and let me start my own barbershop. And that's yeah. kind of the journey. So the blessing of me having a kid <clears throat> in um, at such a young age was really like a kick in the ass that mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for. Right. But mm -hmm. the unconditional love and the just that push to make force me to do something really brought the best out of me. Wow. So I always look at him as like he was he was a God's gift to really change my life. What was the longest hours you spend in a barbershop when you were oh, man. observing? Oh, oh, when I actually was cutting hair? No, observing. Oh, observing, probably three hours. Okay. Yeah. 
What, yeah. was, the, what was the craziest story? Oh, they... man, the jokes, man. <laughs> the jokes. You got to have thick skin. It's different now. Right? Even my own shops, we kind of not as strong. But, like, you know, things have changed. But those times, you were talking about the 90s. Yeah. Guys would skip over you. It would be three barbers yeah. um, out in this area. Actually, this was in Fort Myers. I'll plug them out. It was a place called Intrigue Barbershop on Fowler. It's not there anymore. I think they moved. But yeah. it was a guy named Said Tom and Corey. Yeah. And they were the three barbers. It's not like now where there's a bunch of barbershops right. uh, in the area. So they were the three guys. So if you didn't go to them, you know, you ain't getting that you're not getting cut. a haircut, right? Yeah. So that, yeah. was the, that was the haircut. It was like you would get a haircut. We'd go into these like little salons. And one of my buddies in high school was like, I'd have this haircut. I look like Forrest Gump. Yeah. And it was this heavy weight line in my hair. And he's like, yo, you've got to go to this barbershop. You know, the, <laughs> right. the black barbershop, right? To get that good face. Yeah, you got it. Right? Yeah, to get the blurry <laughs> yeah. face, right? Get the blurry face. So you go yeah. in there and you sit down. Yeah. And I mean, the jokes. <laughs> and then they, would, they knew their buddies. So you, they would skip you. And you just have to sit there and you wait on... <laughs> What the hell am I going to say in high school? You're just going to stay quiet and wait yeah, your turn until right. they finally call you. And yeah. Between the jokes and the haircut took about 30, 40 minutes per person. Right. But that would get you in. But it was a good time. It yeah, was a good beautiful. time. Yeah, I, mean, I got I to tell you, like, I, I told I told him just before the show started, Cornell, I don't think you were in the room. But yeah. I, in 20 years, I've had three people cut my hair. Yeah. <laughs> and so much of it has to do with the camaraderie in the shop yeah. as opposed to, like, Obviously, it's a quality haircut. Otherwise, I wouldn't go. Right. But right. that like camaraderie in the atmosphere is like what keeps me coming back and not wanting to go to anybody else. Right. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. Like, that loyalty. <laughs> so I think it's really cool that you highlighted. You know, education, college might not have been it, but you picked up a skill and that allowed you right. to start a business. Right. 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 I, I think a lot of kids miss that. Yeah. Right. Um, I definitely want to hear more about how you started the business. I think that would be really cool to hear, right? Um, especially with having a child, because I think a lot of people don't realize when you have it, there's three things that you need to do to live above the poverty line. 99% chance. One is get a high school diploma. Two is have a full-time job. Three, don't have a child before 21. So that's that third one. You, you, you flunked on that one, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. But you found a way to overcome that right. with, with that huge burden you know i don't want to call children a burden but right right burden, well so. i mean at, at, at you know 17 going into 18 years old it definitely felt like a burden i'm not yeah. gonna lie right like i'm not i'm like hey i'm ready to be a dad but it's so weird no matter what's thrown in you in life you know i preach it today to even guys that are starting in a barber barbershop don't play safe get yeah. that car yeah. get that Get a little bit of that smart debt. Right. You know, you need a vehicle to get you to A to B. Yeah. Get something you like. Like, Love don't that. go right away and get yourself a Benz, but get yourself a new car, yeah. right? If you can yeah. afford it. If you're making this much money, and don't be afraid to pay it, because what that automatically does is make you come to work maybe an hour earlier. Right. Allows you to stay an hour later. Yeah. If don't play complacent, then you, you yeah. have nothing to push against you. So Five things that can allow you to make more money. Right. Like enable you to work, <clears throat> yeah. like buy work boots, buy a truck, buy something that allows you to go buy your own clippers right. or stuff like that. Right. So that you have the freedom to go work. Right. Right. So smart investments on anything. Get yourself that apartment. Like don't play it too safe and have a broke mindset. Mm -hmm. Get the things that are achievable, but you have to look at your numbers and your finance. What am I making weekly? What am I right. making monthly? Right. Is this a little bit nervous for you to invest into? Right. Put yourself into situations that make you nervous because yeah. if you have the skill set and you have the passion to do what you want to do, you're never going to fail. Right. All it's going to do is motivate you to do a little bit more and work harder than you were doing before. Right. right. right? Dumb investments would be like you're not really doing anything and you buy jewelry and, and you know, on, on, you know, layaway or something right, like right, that, right? And, right? and you're paying something, a cost that has no value and you're, you're just trying to figure out what to do and putting yourself in with bad credit. Right. But if you got a career, you got a job, how do you advance <clears> in that <throat> job? Put those things behind you. Mm -hmm. So mine was a, you know, like it was a, it was a, it was a force of nature. Right. It was a God given gift. It was whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? It was something mm -hmm. that was placed in my life that forced me to get out of my comfort zone. Right. My sense of, you know, insecurities, my, um, my, maybe my self low, my, my low self esteem, whatever, wherever I was right there forced me to say, Oh wow, this is real. Right. But having loving people around me to be like, yo, here's an opportunity to do something and taking advantage. So I, 
did the hardest thing was like get away from my son right at such a young age to try something new right and then get into a new environment stay with my dad see how what that was living in the city working in the city going to school going to getting into a barbershop and even in the barbershop meeting a a buddy of mine who owned a record label yeah. called uh Raucous, it, it was associated with Raucous Records. It was uh, called the Lyricist Lounge. And they had a, a television show on MTV. It was like comedy skit, skit, yeah. skits um, that to do. We worked together. A guy named Wordsworth. You right. met him before. Yeah, yes, so he, yes, was, yes, he was yes. an actor on the show. That's how we built our relationship. Okay. So I started interning for them. And I thought, you know, wow, this is awesome. Like yeah. going to all these parties, holding cameras. I was working for free. I was doing intern stuff. But all those lessons that I did being an intern working with a company when I came back and moved to Florida and was time to, you know, get those young 20s out my way. I was going back and forth, visiting my son, making, you know, and and learning about myself, which was most important, was when I came here, I took all those skill sets of like working with a music company as well as cutting hair. Mm -hmm. And then I started to run my business or start, I started the process of opening my business. Like you would open up a record label. Mm -hmm. So the way I did guerrilla marketing and, and promotion is how I started developing twin cuts. So like the street team motion, when I was on this on 42nd street, passing out flyers to go to BB Kings for like to see big daddy Kane perform and let, you know, so everyone knows what 42nd street. 42nd Street's in Times Square, Manhattan. Times Square, so, right? right? Center of the universe. Yeah. Right. So, so, right, for sure. So it's like, you know, they got these places, but I was all over the city doing that. I was I was handing stuff out. You know, yeah. we're not mm-hmm. in those, like, take a picture and here's my Instagram and let me get a lot of the likes. Right. When I was a barber, I was going to Kinko's, printing my name and number down on, on paper. Yeah. You know, light pink, pastel blue, yellow, white, and cutting them into 12 squares and actually walking up to people and having to give them cards. I couldn't say... This is how my work looks. We didn't have digital cameras. Right, now, what do you right. think the impact of that was on you as a communicator versus people now? Because so many people start a business now. It's all online. Right. right? I and, think it's and, a benefit to both. I think some of it takes <clears throat> away the interaction and relationships with people. So you're right. building right. from, yeah, yeah. from a distance. You can make a lot of money. But at the same time, when you interact with people, you don't have how to build. And mm-hmm. I think some of the greatest success comes from relationships, right? right? It's who you know. Yep. You can have uh, a million people like your post, but right. it's the one person who who is willing to spend for your worth, right? Right. So who are you looking to really attract? Yeah. And I think the best way to do it is incorporating both. Now, my interaction of talking to people to get somebody into my barber chair when I first started by giving them a business card, you know, yeah, can you cut hair? Can you fade yeah. good? You, I'd yeah. have to answer all those questions and I had to show and prove now it's a little easier. Hey, look at my Instagram. Oh, damn, right. you do a good job. Right. I'll sit with yeah, you. Instead of having blind trust, like, hey, go, yeah, go ahead. It Cut changes. Right. It changes. And I, I appreciate that, you know, hey, I have to prove to you that mm-hmm. I got to be good at what I do. And then so when, when times change and um, I moved here, I started doing nightclub promotion. I did a open mic back in the day called the Lyricist Lounge South. Yeah. Um, Early, early on when I moved here, then I started doing nightclubs downtown. It was like club level back in the day. I used yeah. to do a Saturday night party. Right. And I funded myself. So as I was, as I moved here, I sat in the barbershop with a plan for five years to open up my barbershop. I would meet people, relationships again, met a guy. He was a DJ from New York. Yeah. We talked. We said, yo, you know, what? there's a lot of like poets and rappers and Everybody out here knew it's a platform. I came from a company that was doing open mics and platforms and right. live performances, and we did an open mic, created big success from that. What right. I was doing was cutting the people behind my chair, yeah. making money with from them cutting behind my chair, and then they were coming to my event and paying five to ten dollars at the door. So I was doubling up on my clientele as I was expanding my yeah. my network. Then That's I had beautiful. this huge network and brought that network to downtown Fort Myers. Mm-hmm. And where I came up with the name Twin Cuts uh, Enterprise. Okay. So then I was all about marketing and brand recognition. So I have you on on the on my arm. That was the font. Right. So I'm mm-hmm. a big believer of font. You look at McDonald's, you yeah. know right away. You look at the O and Oreo. You look at the R and Reese's. And where Twin City come from? Yeah. Twin Cuts. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Twin yeah, cuts. people call me Twin. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That was just my nickname, and I cut hair. So it was just okay. cutting cuts. Gotcha. Yeah. So then it was Twin Cuts Enterprise. It was Twin Cuts Entertainment. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you could cut records. You could cut hair. You could do – so it was just – it kind of blended in. So I would have Twin Cuts uh, okay. Enterprise all on the windows, and everyone knew me as this dope barber that was cutting hair, and they knew my club. So when it was time for me to open up my, my shop, all I did was save, 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 doubling up on both because I was like, yo, I got to open up my own business. 
And then I took the name recognition and the name brand yeah. and I put it on my first storefront. That's so beautiful. then when people came by, it was like, yo, that's the, that's the place that we go to the club at. And we know he's a barber. And it almost allowed a lot more easier early success right. when I started back in 2010 when like the recession was tough and I was yeah. like, you're not going to, mm. you're not going to be successful. But right. I built up enough clientele that even if I didn't have any barbers working with me at the beginning, I was able right. to cover my bills. That's good. So did you buy the building or you rented I the wish. building? I wish I had to start from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So. Right, right. yeah it's right. tough to buy a building now. Yeah. It's very tough Florida. to buy, buy a building now. If I, I mean, you know, if I could go back, <clears throat> there's a lot of moves I w- could have done back then mm-hmm. that I look at now, and especially with the real estate market here in Southwest Florida, right. with that club money, that I could have really done some smart moves that I've learned now. Hindsight's twenty twenty. The yeah. reality is, at least I didn't do dumb shit right. with right. my money, right? Yeah. I did buy, t- t- I put money towards two barbershops and my home. So this yeah. is a really good point that you, you brought up to me before we started talking here, and I, I'm really excited to get to it. Um. So many sound bites in there. And mm-hmm. I think that the first one that, that I want listeners, especially the young people, to take away was you weren't looking to have a prayer answered when you had your son, right? But it might have been the prayer, the answer to a prayer that you needed. Yes. Right? Yeah. To yes. straighten you out and to get you on the right path and to motivate you, uh-huh. right? And it changed you as a person, set you on the right path, mm-hmm. right? And then you were talking about the constant investment. You and I were talking about Nike, how when Nike started, Nike was selling $8 million in shoes a year. Right. The guy was broke. He couldn't pay. He couldn't bring himself to a restaurant mm-hmm. because every single dollar went in to his business. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So you were working two jobs. You're trying to get the bank account going to start not just one, but two shops. Yeah. Right off the bat. Can you talk about that investment and the next 10 years of or 11 years of investment from there? Yeah, for sure. So like my first year. So, you know, I have seven locations now presently. <laughs> But when I started in 2010, I opened up my first one. My second one was in 2013. It wasn't until two years ago I started paying myself as a business owner. So for 10 years of me being in business, I cut hair like I didn't own anything. So I I paid my food, my movies, and I got a daughter as well. So it's like taking care of my daughter. She's nine years old. My son during his – everything I did, I was paying with money working behind the chair even though there was money coming in from the business. What I was doing was always stacking my money, preparing for other investments to create. Yeah. And that's allowed me to put money towards my house and also started up my second business. A reality check for me was when it was time for me to open my second business, was I went to the bank and I wanted a $5,000 loan to get some chairs. Yeah. And, you know, I have at that time like $2,000 in my pocket yeah. rolled up. Right. But... They don't know that. Yeah. And they're asking me for, you know, we don't see the type of money that you're making. Right. As a barber. Right. And I learned at that moment, right, as a cash (laughs) business, I said, wow, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. I have to make sure that I'm showing everything Mm -hmm. and doing everything correct. So it was just really changed my mindset knowing that no matter how much money that you you make if you're not really doing it properly as far as getting the right accountant right. and trying you when you're young like money was new to me yeah so even from mm-hmm. the time i was doing clubs like i said i made I, if I, I could go back hindsight make some some changes <clears throat> when i was uh and the system doesn't the teach you that no the system doesn't teach you that not at all not mm-hmm. not me i mean i haven't done that algebra problem since algebra right. days right yeah. i don't know <laughs> I, I didn't do it then i cheated then yeah to pass but um <laughs> You know, I didn't like all that stuff. I needed to know how to live life. And those weren't life lessons. But I also believe that life lessons are from mistakes that you make trying. Well, yeah. Most right. Definitely. So just do it. Like all my, I, I appreciate the fact that I never had a mentor. I made money. I could look back and say, damn, I could have thrown money on houses, got mortgages, rented yeah. them out and air beat them be right now, be a millionaire. But again, I didn't do dumb shit. Yeah. Um. I was making great money in the clubs, still drove my little old Scion car, could yeah. have had a Mercedes while other promoters were competing against me at the time, learning from what I was doing. Right. They were going on Vegas trips, and I was driving the same car, and all I kept doing was stacking, stacking, yeah. stacking, stacking. Yeah. And without a bank loan, was able to get my first business file. That's beautiful. And then I was able to you know, go into my second business, had some money on the side, put it towards my second business. And it was relationships, again, because my marketing strategies – for the first three years of Twin Cuts, starting with one, just me by myself, got six solid barbers, expanded into seven to eight chairs in that same barbershop, <clears throat> was cutting the whole FGCU team. 
That's basketball, awesome. soccer, football. They started telling everybody in school. Everybody started to see me. Yeah. They go to that tournament. They win the tournament. Dunk City. I was just going to say, yeah. did, were you, were you cutting I that was the that barber yet? of the Dunk Wow, that's I awesome. I cut the whole entire roster. Actually, I had an NCAA um, season assist photo that I cut the center of, of. I put an eagle on his head with a basketball and put my arm next to him, and he shared it, and they sent me a message that they had to remove his name from it. Wow. And um, But it didn't matter because... Yeah. It, that, that's it preparation beats opportunity yeah. right, right there, right? So even that's, they took it down and went it went luck. that way, right? So I uh I wanted to open up the, my very first time I ever wanted to open up a shop was in the Gulf Coast Town Center and they wouldn't even answer my phone call. Oh, we have several shops. They just there was no one to speak to. Right. I, then I opened up my first shop on Six Mile Cypress in Colonial. Three years later, I built a relationship. I'm cutting everybody in FGCU. I called them up about three years later because I said, oh, they just became Dunk City. Yeah. Someone's going to open up a barbershop across that college. Oh, yeah. I have to do it because I'd rather become my own competition. Oh, definitely. We established Twin Cuts in the shop locally. So now we have all the local business coming plus the college kids. If I open here, all the college kids are going to go there, but I'm still going to sustain a, a, a successful business because we have the local community behind right. me at the first location. Mm, right. Call up Gulf Coast Town Center. Oh, yeah, are you looking to move? I said, no, I'm looking to expand. He said, okay, I'll meet you at this unit. So yeah. it went from not even getting a phone call to saying developing that relationship. And I sent them an email with a picture of me with all the Dunk City kids. That's beautiful. Taking a picture like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Right? And they thought it was great. Day one, open up in the Gulf Coast Town Center. Ten barbers starting first day, line out the door to come in there. Every wow. single student That's and basketball amazing. player was in there taking pictures and has shared my information on Twitter. Yeah. So just off again, going off of relationships was very strong with those kids and building it up. Yeah. And then, you know, a few years after that, a business partner that owned um, the nightclub downtown, his name's Danny. He uh, was the owner of Level. Uh, was like, you know, what are we trying to do, man? You look like you got an awesome thing going on. I'm like, God, it's just it's, it's a lot. I'm, I don't have too much time. All this yeah. going back and forth. It's sure. like, well, maybe I can help you. Make yeah. you look at it different. Maybe I can help you look how we can scale this business because this is what I do. Mm -hmm. We got together. There was a good relationship, a good trust over there. We jumped into a business partners together and we developed our third business and within six years, we opened up five more businesses together. So to, on top of that, we got seven businesses. That's beautiful. Yeah. Man. Wow. That's beautiful. You, so teams are just as important as doing an individual. I look in the future that I would love to have 100 twin cuts at a low percentage yeah. than owning seven of them at 100 percentage and not having any time. Time is very important for me. Yes. Uh, the way you, you spoke earlier, you, you kind of put out that self-discipline for you was big. It's how you kind of got to where you are now, but that is challenging. How would you encourage your listeners? Man, you have to have a why. Yeah. So mine was a given why. My son was my why. But a why could be anything. You want a yacht. could yeah. be your why. It could be materialistic. It's not to fault what your whys are, but you have to find what your why is. The second thing is you got to find your inspiration. Right. Right. What inspires you? When I go to work, I still cut hair today. I'm going to work after this podcast. To cut right. hair. Not because I have to anymore. Right. The days of me going to work, working the day before Christmas, Thanksgiving, and paying all my bills, cutting hair right. has changed. Yeah. I have I've developed um, streams of income where it's not a necessity for me to go to work. So I kind of work on my hours now. I do my own appointments, but I love the passion of cutting hair. I can yeah. do this the rest of my life. That's mm. beautiful. Cutting hair. Even if I lost all my businesses, which helped me take risks, the worst thing that could ever happen to me is I get behind a barber chair and cut hair, yeah. which I don't mind at all. Because you have a trade to fall back on. Right. And I enjoy doing it. And I love doing it. And it's like art to me. So for those that are out there, if you're not doing your traditional adaptive way of learning in school, if you're a creative or any type of te technical skill that you may want to get into, find something that you love to do. Once you figure that out, then... How can you become the best at it? Yeah. And that was another thing that was important for me as a barber was your time is limited. Yeah. You know, we all get old. Yeah. We've all seen the movie Barbershop, right? Yep, yep, I didn't want yep. to be Cedric the Entertainer. I yeah. didn't want to be 60 years old <laughs> in a barbershop talking about back in my day. Right. And how right. great I was. You know, we didn't touch base of like, you know, the education and the platform. I travel around the whole entire world now teaching and educating on stages and platforms and working at... Um, you know, events and football events. I've done all all of that. All of that doesn't matter when you get old. Right. Right. I'll be right. 60 years old and say, a guy's not going to come in. A kid's not going to come in and say, look at me 
and look yeah. at the young barber. He's going to see old and young. Right. He might say, well, most of the time, he's going to sit with the young barber, which is going to mean my clientele is going to start to drop anyway. Right. He might have made a mistake yeah. sitting with the young yeah. barber over me. But at the end of the day, that's just the reality of it. It's going to be yeah. like he's the only guy. He's not going to look at me and say, oh, wow, this guy was a teacher at Paul Mitchell. He's a – and this educator is traveling around the world. He's just going to say, yo, he's an old barber. Yeah. And then my body breaks down a little bit. My biggest fear was pushing carts at Publix yeah. at an old man because I didn't want to. So whatever you want to do. If I was a plumber, yeah. I want to be – I want to build a relationship with him, the best barber. I want to be a district manager plumber. I want to be like, where can I start and what's my goal? So within hair – Getting behind a chair, understanding yeah. how it was to be very busy, right? Doing the mistakes of because like I made all those mistakes. I understood that coming in late, leaving early, um, taking smoke breaks, doing certain things affected my business, right? right? right. As I got older, I re- re- understood that you have to be very professional. It's not all about talent. Talent is very strong, right. but the relationship you built with your client, mm-hmm. twenty years, two barbers. Is very important. Yeah. That's a that's a re- residual income for you, right, right? Right. So we talk about the basic necessities. You have driving, food, and living. Yeah. If you got, you can cover those or transportation, food, <clears throat> and living. Yeah. If you can cover those three things, you can do with do anything that you want. Definitely. definitely. So if I get ten, 10 clients to see me every single week, if I cut you every week and you give me twenty five, thirty bucks for every, every week for a haircut, right? Right. Every month. You could be my water bill. Yeah. You could yeah. be my light bill. I get yeah. three more guys that could be my rent. Three yeah. more, four more. Guys. If I could get 15 people to see me every single week, yeah. weekly, four times a month, I can cover those three three basic necessities. Mm-hmm. Add a couple of more people, maybe my insurance and a few other things. Say about 17 to 20, which is very achievable because when you work in a barbershop, it's busy on the weekend. Yeah. And a lot of guys can cut 15 to 20 people within a little bit of time right. every single week. So you've right. got to build a relationship with the guys that see you every single week. Once right. you get those three things, what do you want to do next with your life? Right. Right. right? You can buy Clothes, you can look flashy, you could go out, you could spend money, or you could put it towards other things. You want to put it towards like getting a new shop or right. traveling, whatever you want to do. Keep adding on, look at your numbers, right. and that will allow you to progress and grow. So, any trade school or any trade that you have, I think you should look at it that way like, okay, how can I become the best step one? Level one. Right. Once you've maxed that out and become great at that, yeah. where do you put yourself to get to the next level? I like that. Mm-hmm. So now talk to the listeners about the competitions, the barber competitions. Right. Like so, com- me competing, like right, barber yeah. battles and stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I took that journey probably in 2011. So I was on World Star Hip Hop in like 2010, 2011. Mm-hmm. There was a ad that they were doing like barber competitions. Mm-hmm. It was so inspiring. It was like, wow, this is really cool. I'm going right. to do this. And they were doing one in New York. And um, I think there was one in West Palm Beach locally. Right. Drove out there. I saw it. I was like, we're not used to this. And this is, this is where social media and the power of, of social media is good. By right. paying attention to that was different than when I was growing up. The only way to get better at being a barber was the guy who was better than me in the barbershop. Right. right. I didn't only know. I couldn't see how people cut in L.A. and in London and Toronto and other yeah, you parts You had no pulse on the competition. Other than I had no idea. Right. 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 So now we had an option to see that. Now they're doing these competitions. Right. And I went out there. The first competition I saw was in New York. And I'm like, that's a home home team. Like, I could go there. I could stay with my dad. Mm-hmm. I don't got to worry about a hotel and compete. And I jumped in the ring and I did it. I lost. I was against some of the best. I did yeah. about three competitions at that time. And I lost all three of them. But what I did was I built name recognition. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think never be afraid to lose. Yeah. Right? I like because that. It's good. Somebody from the outside can make fun of the guy who lost the fist fight. Right, but the guy who beat up the guy who fought back will right. always have respect over him Definitely. more than the guy from the outside being a critic. Right, right. Who was even afraid to get into the ring. That yeah. was like the Lower East Side Manhattan yeah. version of Teddy Roosevelt's "Man in the Arena" speech. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt has a famous speech where he it's the man in the arena, the person, the spectator. Um, you know, there's a, there's no value or no weight in his opinion on the man that's actually in the arena. Right, right, right. right. So, yeah. and that's I think most people are so afraid to get into that. See, that's even better right. that you didn't even know that. I so no you're on par with Teddy Roosevelt. That was so amazing. You know. <laughs> that's a, hey, listen, I put my name up with great thinkers and great minds. But I always said that, and I got a lot of respect that way, right? Mm-hmm. And people recognize my face. So these barbers that were winning the competition, they're doing amazing things right now. Right, right. 
I started going to these trade shows. We have a big one in Orlando called Orlando Premiere. I go mm-hmm. to Orlando Premiere. One of the judges that was at the trade show is on stage educating and teaching how to do haircuts. Right. I'm buying my clippers. I asked the guy at the front of, uh, at the salesman at, at the at the booth. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm just curious. Like, what they're doing is pretty dope. What's the process? How do you get get to do that? That's another thing. Feel free to humble yourself and ask questions. Right. right Don't walk right. in there like with expectations. Right. Before I even ask that question, I go to hair show. I would watch. We're doing a class at 2 o'clock. I would sit in front of the class. I'd raise my hand, ask questions. I'd buy clippers. I would see people on social media. They had little small booths. I'd walk around the booths. I'd buy a comb from this guy. I'd buy a comb from that guy. I have seen your work. It's amazing. Right. Recognizing I support you. I appreciate what you're doing. The respect comes back. Right. The guy was like, yo, you should speak to this lady right over there. She's she She's the one you want to talk to. I spoke to her, and she was like... Who are kind of like, hmm, I hear the story all the time, but being genuine and trying to figure out what to do, she was like, Well, here's my business card. Yeah. I need to, if you can you send me your license, a resume, and an uncut video of you cutting hair? By the time I walked out the door, I always kept my license and my a little bit of my bio on my phone. I sent it phone. to her, sent her a message, said, Hey, I'll get a, a video yeah. for you. Called up the local college out here, called them up. Said, do you mind if I do a 40-minute clipper cutting class? Yeah. Recorded it, sent it over to her. She gave me an audition at on stage. I get on stage, get one of my barbers, cut his hair. The guy who's the lead educator of the company was a judge at the barber battle. Wow. She's like, yeah, you know, Ken, uh, this guy, Kenny Duncan's, uh, he's, he's a very huge inspiration for me in the industry. He's been doing it for a long time. Right. She's like, I mentioned your name, but when you said Twin Cuts, he goes, oh, yeah, I've seen him. He's, he's a good dude. He's like, you know, he's always at the battles. He's always asking questions. Yeah. He's sitting there and he's watching me do it. Yeah. He was the one who was like, he's green, but he's got potential. Yeah. That relationship, getting in that ring, losing, yeah. having respect for my work, right. seeing me out there ask questions was the same person who put me in to get me on stage. That's amazing. To be a part of this event where a lot of guys who won yeah. are not even on the same platform getting paid by these major companies <clears throat> right. where I lost and I'm getting paid by a major company to travel around the world now. That, that's beautiful. So there's a theme that you keep touching on and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. How do you feel about luck? Oh, man, luck. Oh, man. Wow. Because So, I mean, let me tell you why I asked that. So, you, you've you brought up several instances where you were put, you put yourself in a situation where you got lucky. But you were prepared to get lucky. Yeah. Right, right, right. You were always prepared. You, you had the resume and the phone. Right. right? Preparation. <clears throat> so, I think opportunity more than luck. I don't know if it's luck. Luck is like maybe playing the lottery and hitting for a million. Like right. you're like on a scratch ticket, which I suck at. I, right. I do think that <laughs> I, I'm just lucky or prepared for opportunity in life right. and business. Yeah. But I suck kind of at luck because right. if I bet on the sports team, right. they're right. losing. It yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> Anytime I put money down on a fighter, they lose a scratch yeah. ticket, slot machine. I don't win at gambling at yeah. all. But being prepared for opportunity, which we would consider maybe a lucky opportunity, but I don't know yeah. if it's lucky because if you work towards that goal, I remember the first time I went to that trade show, yeah. I went back home and I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to try by next year to get myself an opportunity to do yeah. this. So wherever I could go and yeah. speak to the right people to sure. recognize who I was, validated, you know, yeah. some type of relationship was to be, to be you know, it's, it's all about who you know. That's yeah. it. So it's a P word. P. Persistent. Persistent. Yes. So anybody that's ever heard me speak, any any use that we talk to or anything like that, the exact equation that I tell them is luck equals preparedness meets opportunity. Right. It's preparedness and opportunity. There is no such thing as Say luck. That one you, more can't, time? you can't get luck. So luck equals preparedness plus opportunity. <clears throat> yes. Right? You got to be prepared <clears throat> to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes. That's right. how you get lucky. I, I believe there's opportunity around us all the time. Oh, yeah. Like every day, which we call luck. I think we all have equal opportunity for luck. Right. I think it's the it's the mindset and the preparation. Yeah. So the first yeah. is, are you prepared at what you're doing? Like, think mm-hmm. a little bit ahead. Like, right. I don't know why I kept my license on my phone. I just, I did it. Who knew? Who knew? When right. I was going around a trade show, I had an iPad. I had my five photos on it. Mm-hmm. One, I don't even like doing designs. I'm an artist. I like doing designs on my own time. But right. my first photo was that FGCU Eagle when I show somebody, hello, I like your work. I'm a barber too, and I have a shop in Fort Myers. And I show him, he's like, yo, that's amazing. 
Right. Yeah. And then I scammed through and I didn't show them a bunch of them. I was like, yo, you're a good barber. And then they would follow me back and we'd start building up a relationship. Sure. So there was a form of preparation there. Yeah. But then the mindset is walk into every opportunity with balance. Yeah. Um, if you're always so high, when things crash, you're very hard on yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you're always walking around low, you always miss out on the opportunity. Right. And you right. Don't, you're not willing to take the risk. You overlook it. You're too... So I, I walk in with every situation where balance. Yeah. I'm going to take the good with the bad, the bad with the good. When things are going great, yeah. expect there's going to be a bump. When That's things good. are going really down, yeah. man, there's something great about to happen. Just ride through it and take it for what it is because none of it's going to be do my worst fear to me. And that would probably be like being homeless and not having anything. I'm like, no matter what happens in my life, I'm not built to be that way. And once right. I understood that, yeah. that I'll always do something. Maybe it might not be the most ideal situation. Yeah. But I always do something that I love to keep me out of that type of gutter. Mm-hmm. What's the average amount of guys you have at each barber shop? Oh man, we have ten shares at each shop, so we we're, we're we generally stay around eighty to eighty five percent full okay. collectively at, at each shop. How do you manage the? You know, everyone talks about the labor shortage, and it's always it's hard turnover. to find hard to find good help, right? So yes. How do you manage that? Huge turnover, right? So it's it's it's, it's expected. People always have dreams to open up their own business. You lose people that way. People just are, just have looking for the better opportunity. Um, some people outgrow the system. Mm-hmm. You know, just so many so many things that happen. The, the, the most important thing is just to keep focusing on the business and the brand, right. and keep putting it out there. And then people will always come. So you know, sure. don't worry about the person and. Going back to that mindset, what helped me develop that mindset was owning my first business. When somebody would quit, I thought the mm-hmm. world was going to end. When the AC broke, I was like, oh, my God, I'm not prepared to pay $5,000 on a business uh, on a new AC. It was like, what, what am I doing? Like, yeah. Now it's like when things happen, it's expected. Yeah. What's mm-hmm. the solution right. more than the problem? Right, right. I like, that. Help me I like that. All throughout life. Like I've I looked at it as like things happen. Uh, it's the saying that when I was, I was, you know, when we did that thing, I was going through health issues, right? Right, right, right. And I had this uh, mindset that says, "Be better, not bitter." Right. You know. Right. Sit I, down and be sit on stuff you have no control over, right. or look at it. We're natural. Be pissed off about the situation for a second, but what do I have to do next? If right. I waste time trying to ask questions, why something happened, yeah. then looking at like what needs to be done to resolve this situation. You can't right? control what happened to you, but yeah. you can control how you react. Yes. Right. Now, is your dad still around? My father's still around, yeah. So my son moved to New York in uh, two months ago, September 1st. Okay. So he has no kids. He was yeah. working with me. He, he graduated from school as barber school. He worked in my shops, built up a skill set. And we just sat down. And I'm like, yo, man, why don't you just move to New York? You always yeah. ask me about it. You're kind of like a New Yorker in a way. You like the all the sports teams. You grew up, but you've, you're, you're born here. Right. And I'm like, just go out there. You got nothing to lose. Even if you dislike it, like, yeah. the, what's the worst you could say is, hey, I lived in New, New York for a year. Right, it's different right. than me. I always had you. And then yeah. I had my daughter. I'm always had to make something and be stationary and be create opportunities around me right. where you're at an age and you have no responsibility. You've you got a skill set and you got the great surrounding that you could be in New York for a couple of years. You could move to Chicago. You could move to Atlanta. You could go to L.A. You can chase a lot of things. So, right. so do it. The worst thing that ever, ever happened is you could come back to Fort Myers and you have a good – I've created stability for you to always fall back on over here. Right. And that was the most important thing that I ever wanted to do was have stability right. for my kids. So with kids and multiple business, is there ever a time when the, the balance become a challenge? I think there's – uh, a sense of over- overwhelming mm-hmm. that that can happen naturally, right? Mm-hmm. Like you just, I think through time and experience and learning how to challenge it and, and, and trying to tell myself that mindset of just keeping balance, that when things become a little bit overwhelming to to accept the change right. and not let it just destroy me. I, I'm, I'm human. So there's not, there's not, you know, I'm not going to say that I just walk around with a smile and things don't bother me all the time. You do, right. you do think about it, but I try to step out of the small box and look at the bigger picture. I like that. I like that. Now, for individuals that want to uh, find you and, and see you work, what does that look like? So two things. If, if, if you're interested in the area and you're interested in becoming a barber, we do have a shadowing program where um, you can stop into any Twin Cuts. You go to TwinCuts.com. Mm-hmm. That's what is Z, T-W-I-N-C-U-T-Z at uh, uh, dot com. That will show all the businesses 
how they look and where they're located. And then I have my own personal online virtual academy okay, called SeanCaseyAcademy.com, which was designed for students, for um, cosmetologists that are learning to do more short length haircuts and barbering techniques. Okay. And videos so, and stuff like that? Yeah, so I have several walkthrough haircuts <clears throat> on that. Okay. And then I also have a master class on business, how to start a, a barbershop, how to hire for a barbershop, and how to scale a barbershop. Okay. So I do have that academy. Um, it's not credited, but it's more like continuing education, right. um, which is kind of amazing. You get to learn directly from somebody who did it, right? Right. So you <laughs> can buy Mannequin Emma online, stop, pause, and learn. There's a girl right now that I knew who just messaged me. I have it. show you the message a little bit later, but she... Yeah. During COVID, couldn't get, her husband couldn't get a haircut. She had to learn how to cut his beard. She what? was messaging me saying, I'm watching your videos and I'm learning how to do a beard. And she's amazing. giving me a heads up. She just said the, just yesterday, she says, my husband was just in this Netflix show. Um, man, I can't think of the name. And she, she screenshots a picture of the beard and says, I did his beard Wow. for this show. Wow. And I've learned from you. And she's not a barber or anything, yeah. but she learned how to cut his hair through COVID by watching my videos. That's amazing. That's so amazing. anybody can achieve it, right? Uh, I love that, man. Yeah. You're like the Alex Hermosi of hair. <laughs> right. You know who that is? Right. No, I know. Yeah, he, did the same thing. he did the same thing with gyms. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Will, will you still be doing more competitions, barber competitions? So I haven't, like, it's like LeBron doing the slam dunk competition. There's yeah. no value for him to do it anymore. I respect right. it, right? So when I was in, like, uh, at the startup stages, I did it. Right. A lot of times people ask me to judge it. I'm not a fan of judging it either because there's such amazing barbers that do competitions and I'm like I can't even do that who am right. I to judge it I like giving more experience and I like doing mentorship so when <clears> people <throat> hire me and travel around it's more for educational purposes yeah. how can I show you how to do something right some of the things we were talking about in that detention center that yeah. day yeah. is like the overlooking people Look, kids just need a how to yeah and people overlook you can walk in and talk about how great you are hey I'm Sean Casey I own seven shops I own this I do that I travel around I cut celebrities I do everything and then they wow he's amazing and then yeah. I leave the room and it's like what how do I start with? yeah what right? did you yeah. leave them with <laughs> how do you start and yeah. I think that's a missing aspect for most kids and yeah. that's where I yeah. think and they the see the end game but they yeah. don't see the road yeah. true so my right. niche is even with my I, I have a strong a following on social media and I upload videos every day pretty much on the very basics. There are right. people out there that show you how to do amazing designs for the advanced barber. Right. Mine is for the kids are just, hey, let me show you how to turn on the clipper. Right. You may not think about it. I might pick on a clipper, turn it on, do this, make yeah. the adjustment, spray, angle you to the right light, everything, start the haircut and say, okay, step one, do your design. Right. That whole process of starting the clipper, finding the light, all those we, that we overlook because we do it on an everyday um, on, do it every day right. we overlook it yeah. that's valuable information for somebody that's... wanting to learn how to do something right, right. so I target that audience by showing the ups the the, the, the very beginning steps on right. how to do something so you have barbers now that try to get into those competitions or not all day yeah, yeah. there's a few amazing ones there's, I think it's an amazing opportunity all around for inspiration and getting around I still I still as a, a spectator I go to these events if I'm hired to be a part of it or teach at them I'm always um I'm always excited to be a part of it. I think anybody that kind of crosses that bridge and gets into like these companies and stuff, rarely are they going back and they're doing those competitions. It's incredible how at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about how complacent you were to just do the bare minimum. And now you seek opportunities to see where you are in the competition and elevate above it. For sure. Um, you know, that's a, it's an awesome transformation. To and see even for me, yourself. I'm a teacher. Like think about, it. I got held back in school. I had a teacher in third grade. say, well, or four, uh, May sixth grade. So what are you doing in this class? Yeah. Did you see what you did? Because like my grandparents at one time had a teacher meeting and say, maybe his mind's not stimulated. Let's try him in this class. I went to this class and she in front of the whole class was like, what are you doing here? Yeah. Like, in a way, saying like you're dumb, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But now I'm a teacher, right? Right. You know what I mean. But yeah. I'm teaching about things that I love and right. being passionate. I would never <clears throat> let a child feel that way. That's yeah. important. Like you can't do that. Where is that person coming from? Right. Find that inspiration, and that's the tough part about being a teacher is where 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 those skill sets. And even for myself, I'm always a student. Every pretty much every year, I've traveled and I got continuing education in Amsterdam, in Rome, in London. Uh, Toronto yeah. that I paid on my own dime even right. though I get paid to travel around to teach people right. if I see you and you you know how to do a technique that I really want to learn and I got to respect for it I take a vacation and learn 
because yeah. I love to travel. So I'm like, right. wow, I've never been to Toronto, all right, never been to Amsterdam before, but this education yeah, is so amazing in Amsterdam. It's so not I'm time off. Vacation. It's just a, it's redirecting your attention to right. becoming better in a different way. So yeah. I make a vacation and education at the same right. time. So that's how I treat myself to keep expanding my mind, and that brings it back to what I can offer to the kids on my end, or students, or even advanced learners, or whatever. Bet your bank account looks a little different than the teacher that told you you were dumb, too. We <laughs> could definitely say that. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the listeners, uh, creative individuals that are creative but procrastinate, what would you say to them? Procrastination, man, is is you have to develop a system. Mm-hmm. You have to, it's like, the, the process of making your bed every day, right? right? Like you don't want to do it, but once you start doing it, it becomes a habit. The day you stop two days and all of a sudden your room's messy again. Right. It's very difficult to find procrastination, but you've got to start small. Right. You know, if you're procrastinating and you say, hey, I want to have a successful mindset and I want to do this and I want to be rich, you, you, you have to do the levels. Yeah. Find the small things in your life. Mm-hmm. Start there. Develop a system for yourself. And then go from that and, and start taking on new things. And it, it goes back to applying that pressure to yourself. If you add too much pressure, you get discouraged. So if the, even if it's just getting out of bed at an earlier time and making your bed and maybe exercising for 40 minutes, doesn't matter what you do. Just start something small and get in that system. Next thing you know, you're eating a little bit better. Next thing you know, you have the energy to try and work at this job. Next thing you know, you've learned this skill, skill set. Now you can apply it towards something else. Just getting a routine. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't have to race against anybody else's time clock. Really. Just work on your own time clock, but you got to start somewhere. I like that. I like to compare that. yourself to who you were yesterday, right. not anybody else. Yeah. For sure. And so in going out, you know, and I know we got introverts that listen to the show as well that are creative, that want to go into something, but that that trait kind of keeps them in a in a space. What would you say? To an introvert. Man, I'm an introvert extrovert. Yeah. For sure. Well, like, for a while you talked, you know, I kind of figured you you left from that introvert state. I'm and super you just... shy and introvert. I think that's why I surrounded myself with the kids that I did when I was younger. I was a very shy, like, I'd get in and I'd just, like, yeah. nervous and I'd stay quiet. And I still like that. I like to eat by myself. I yeah. ate breakfast before I came here by myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I travel. Yeah. A lot of times I travel alone. I used to go to parties alone. I am the same time as I can start a conversation, but a lot of times I have a great time just being quiet. But also my job, yeah, cutting hair since I was nineteen. You, and especially when I was a busy barber, yeah, right. you got to talk. When I cut fifteen to twenty people every day, there was a period of my time life that now I cut like eight people a day. It's a busy day. Eight to ten right. people. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna cut too much today. Yeah, times have changed, right? But those early days of building the clientele, nineteen to twenty five people in one day. Yes. Yeah. 20 different conversations every yeah. half hour on the hour. Yeah, I'm yeah. always talking. Yeah, I'm home. Yeah. I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> right? When I'm on <laughs> stage, I got to speak for three hours and on yeah. the stage until I'm going, I'm going to dinner. It's like, hey, you want to go grab the food? Like people invite me. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go back to the hotel. Yeah. No, I'm actually going to a restaurant and I just don't want to talk to anybody. Right. So being an introvert is okay. Just use your introvert time wisely. Like yeah. use time to think. Yeah. Right. What do you want to do? Develop that. But also know that you have to. It goes back to building relationships. Yeah. yeah. Know the right person to speak to. Yeah. Start with the simple, you know, hey, how are you doing? Make it a, you know, be a, be a, be a strong listener. Speak yeah. with confidence, but also, um, listen oh like you goodness. like you're like you're listen like you're ignorant yeah right? yeah i so love you, it you can take something from everybody yeah this is have beautiful. you read jordan peterson no i don't even man you I, I got like a list of people that like, I you, you, are, share that. <laughs> you are <laughs> preaching everything please, everything that they say please Amen. share that to me man i yeah. can't i have my mind the problem with me reading is i read he says always always assume somebody doesn't you yeah. somebody that you're talking to knows something you don't yeah right Dude, this was a beautiful conversation, man. I wish we had more time. Yeah, because yeah, the can conversation I mean, is time. amazing. <laughs> you definitely got to come back on the show. Yeah, you got to come back. Didn't even touch the health issues. I know. So we can get into that as well. That definitely. Was... So, uh, you know, I promise you guys. You know, I don't want to uh, take away from my my different um, stations that have the slots, and I know I'm pushing it over the slot. Uh, right now but really man this conversation was beautiful um i promise you guys you definitely will hear more from mr sean casey we'll have him back on the show 
uh, to talk more because we definitely want to dive right? into that, you know, mental health and all that other stuff, man, and just the reason we do what we do. And you beat it, man. Yeah. yeah. Listen, man, listen, guys. I know we didn't go into this, man, but my guy here have beat something major that a lot of people have lost that fight to. You know what? Get him a teaser. Just get him so, a teaser on that. We talk about right before that when we did that 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 we were spoken in the detention center. Yeah, I was. That was on a Thursday. Right. I just did my sixth treatment of chemotherapy. Yes. On Wednesday. Yes. And came in. Yes. I had no eyebrows, no beard. <laughs> That's nothing. true. I, I was the color gray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And I yeah. was going in there and I was talking with people. So yeah, I had that yeah. mindset of be, be better. Yeah. Be don't be you know be better not bitter. Right. I carried that through that that stage and it you was did, it, man. it was allowed me to push through some of the dar darkest times. Yeah. Through that journey, yeah. allowed me to see things at a level wow. that that appreciates the now. Yes, yes. Don't expect tomorrow. Right. But right. build for tomorrow. Yes, yes. Guys, listen, guys, I really want, you know, we wanted to create this story today. We did. You guys heard it from Mr. Casey. I promise you guys, you definitely will be getting a chance to listen to him, dive into that story and, and, and what that journey was like. I'm Mr. Casey, man. I appreciate yeah, you coming man, on the show. Yeah, man. Thank you for having so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, I appreciate awesome. that, man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm looking this, forward to it. We'll definitely have a, a part two. I enjoy def it, man. Definitely, man. And there you guys have it. Thank you for staying tuned uh, right here at EOS Club, where we create stories, and you guys heard it. We just created a story from the man himself, the owner of Twin Cuts Barber, Mr. Sean Casey. Well, there you have it. The host came, the guest came, and the story was created. Thank you to our sponsors, EHAS Inc., Karis Capital, and the Cornell Bunting LLC brand. Go check out the books, courses, and materials at www.cornellbunting.com. Thank you again for listening to the show. Check back again to hear another tale from another unique guest right here at EHAS Club.